Hello everyone, this is Matt Whitaker with Quest and welcome to PeopleSoft Week Game Changers. Today's session is Lift PeopleSoft and Shift to OCI, the story of the Paradise Island resorts that built value, scalability, and sustainability. A few housekeeping notes to go over before we get started. All attendee lines are in mute and will stay in mute throughout this session. If you have any questions, please put them in the question drop down box located on the GoToWebinar panel. We will answer them at the end of the session. This session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Quest content library. And at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Mahesh, who will kick things off. Yep. Uh, good morning, all. Thank you for taking time to join this webinar. Um, brief about my background. I come from long time Oracle applications, DBA, and played pretty much every role that is there to consider. And currently, I'm responsible. I, I my role at DataWell is at a global practice lead, and my past five to six years have been. Uh, lifting and shifting and then transformation of ERP applications in various forms to cloud platforms. Um, today we are going to discuss one of those case studies where we moved uh, PeopleSoft on-prem environment to OCI and how we did it and how we approached it and uh, what are the things that made difference in with respect to executing the project and operationalizing the PeopleSoft environment on OCI environment. Um, and what are the key elements that we need to look into when we are planning for PeopleSoft uh, application migration and what we learned in this project, how you can avoid them and take benefit, benefit of those uh, pointers. We'll review that. And with respect to DataWell, this is a little bit of uh, about DataWell, what we do um, and uh, how we help our customers and uh, what qualifies us to present this uh, particular webinar is the cloud migrations and uh, coming from experience of not just PeopleSoft, but various, various enterprise applications moving to cloud platforms and challenges. Um, we'll be reviewing all those details so the again the brief is like more and more uh, cloud migrations are becoming mandatory for various reasons um, and while migrating erp applications to cloud whether they are in front of all other applications uh, when it comes to corporate application footprint and landscape or where they are towards the end Various we've seen various strategies in migrating, but it's it is becoming more and more mandatory to move these applications to cloud just to take advantages that we get from cloud. Um, so it's just a matter of when versus uh, whether it will go or not, and very few cases we notice um, staying on prem forever um, scenario. So to achieve or to execute this project of migrating from on-prem to OCI and how it changes changes operational uh, uh, activity and if it is the first time cloud journey versus uh, we've done other applications and PeopleSoft is just following, then it becomes more easy. But if it is the first time journey, then it becomes more complicated whether you have cloud aware resources within the team or not that makes it uh, more complicated uh, um, and things like that so in this presentation we will look at what are the seven essential elements that you can exercise and how each element helped us uh, in executing one of these projects for us and that is particularly for people soft so we'll go through those um, scenarios um, here and the key elements to review um, and then what was achieved by this particular customer right so as we start any project with a specific objective so um, as we've completed this project um, we could um, give these details so what was done so as part of the initiative to cloud migration that was 
they're working on um, obsolete hardware and they wanted to transform the application go to saas like solution but they cannot switch to another on prem hardware and then go directly to saas while incurring these additional costs the strategic move was to first go to oci cloud uh, operationalize there and then within 18 months to 24 months go to saas so while doing so for the time that the went to oci they've off the top they cost saved 40 percent of cost with respect to um, on-prem infrastructure and support resources needed to uh, take care of the environment uh, they've seen the productivity increase increase as well wherein on-prem some processes were taking like 60 minutes or so now it is done in nine minutes sort of uh, productivity improvements as well with respect to certain tasks once they move to cloud. The, and with respect to what is their size and how long it took for them to migrate from on-prem to cloud, they had three total number of environments, two non-prod and one prod, and we were able to complete the migration um, within three months. And within three, and that includes 20 days of hyper care as well just after moving it, just completing one cycle of uh, um, two cycles of uh, payroll execution on OCI environment and making sure there are no incidents or hiccups uh, while uh, they're in that hypercare mode. So while doing so, we also migrated their Oracle database, their, that is their database platform in this particular case, um, and we migrated them from 12C to 19C and because we are going to 19C, we had to upgrade people's tools upgrade. We have to perform that upgrade. And we also went from on-prem AX um, operating system to Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux. And as part of this entire cycle, they've conducted two rounds of testing cycles. Um, and each time with the uh, production, like close to production, um, data uh, was migrated from production to cloud and then compared their uh, payroll uh, execution and making sure that they don't have any anomalies. So before they actually migrated production to um, OCI, they got to execute the same process twice um, on OCI non-prod environments. And what what it did is basically as part of their 24 months transformation plan the first step is to go to oci be stabilize the environment and then start the um, future state transformation that is SaaS implementation to take place and with the effective uh, way we were able to do in short time not having any incidents um, they were able to create a strong foundation for the upcoming project uh, that they were planning on executing. So to achieve these objectives, um, DataVail and we've learned over the time to achieve the same results and limit surprises or limit changes once we start executing the project, uh, we've adapted this approach of reviewing these seven um, elements in which each element helps us in various phases and we'll see how they help and what we achieved in each uh, element review, um, how it helped with respect to planning, with respect to execution, and also the confidence that we are gonna get uh, once we place production on this totally new platform that, yep, we don't have any uh, unknown issues or something we didn't plan for. But we, by executing this time and again, irrespective of PeopleSoft or EBS or any other platform, um, this for ERP systems, right? Uh, these seem to be very, um, very important uh, from our learning and uh, we'll review each item and 
in each discussion what we are going to achieve and what we achieved in this particular project this may vary for your finding but as long as you're having these discussions as part of the planning and cover these areas you will feel confident that okay we've covered everything that is there for your application uh, what you believe can be a p1 and and what what can be dealt with if for some reason something was identified but it's not going to be a p1 uh, sort of scenario um, all right we'll go into each one so for any ERP application and similarly for PeopleSoft, the interface jobs and customizations that you have are going to be key um, in making sure that as soon as we go, um, go to new platform, that is the entirely on cloud platform, how do we make sure that there are no P1s, right? So the Prime, uh, it's not just about performance because we are taking um, if we are taking environment from one location to other location and we refer to when we refer to interface jobs, we are taking only one component and placing it somewhere else. right? And then when it comes to interface jobs, they are never um, done the same way um, with each uh, interface. When I say it's in the same way, it is like so the say processing can be done using a DB link. It can be done with a, a file transfer and load and transact or um, scenarios like that. When we do that, what we have seen is um, with customers is that they test it, but they don't test performance. But they, they with respect to that, they don't actually compare with the production like volume and see what happens and then they test it and at the same time they didn't look at all the details with respect to hey it processed only 10 records versus 10 uh, 10 000 records and it worked but it took only one minute with 10 but when we extrapolate it's going to be long so that is common it's it's not like a surprise for most people but something that we often see but that becomes a major issue if the processing is taking place. One major example being any jobs that use DB-Link connection to, perf to, per to conduct the process, or execute the process, and now they're separated by geographical locations, uh, by two data centers, and one being on cloud, one being on-prem, their um, performance degrades like anything. So, in this process, what we do, what we suggest or what we do is like we look at, first of all, list all the interface jobs and then what each interface job is doing, okay? Is it supposed to run once or twice a day? And what is this method in which it is processing? Is it a file transfer? Okay, file transfer. If it is a file transfer, there is a network speed that we need to look at. And then there is connectivity between those source and target systems and what changes to happen and what changes that are in your control versus what changes that you have to reach out to the vendor and make those changes so so defining each interface job and their connection methods eliminates any connectivity issues oh this was not a key performance indicator but we didn't test it that's okay but as long as we cover that okay, this particular interface needs this kind of configuration on the vendor side or third party system where we are interfacing with and their side of changes to be identified and our side of changes to be identified. And if there is a DB link involved as, as listed here, then knowing, um, okay, we need to retrofit the code, change the design of how it gets processed and that retrofit is accounted into your, um, change and when you are implementing um when, when when you are reviewing this detail you capture that information and make it part of your plan to address that issue so and in this particular slide what what we are looking at is what was achieved by reviewing in this particular project so you will see that i'll be taking the same approach towards what will be the generic 
uh, logic to look at and how it will be efficient and which area we need to look at and how it helped in this particular project, right? So in this part part particular project, when we, we migrated PeopleSoft from on-prem to um, OCI, it helped us create an efficient um, testing plan and KPA success criteria along with the performance needs. And the customer was going through first time OCI, so they were new to OCI environment. And then at the same time, they haven't performed any people's soft data center to data center migration. So in both ways, it was new and it helped us uh, discuss with them and educate them on then what happens and for us to understand what are all the implications and what changes to be part of our plan and what should be part of testing plan, right? That wasn't there before. So having this discussion, having this discussion about interface jobs, it kind of, um, it kind of uh, created a situation where customer was able to efficiently create the testing plan, which in turn uh, gives us uh, no surprises post-production cutover. So that's how it helped. And then we looked at interface connections to inbound and uh, outbound to external vendors. And we, can, we were able to identify that, okay, we um, this in particular interface needs change on our end and this particular interface change needs change on their end and we are going to do this test in non-prod this way so we have to reach out to them twice during these dates and plan for implementation and validation because working with uh, external vendors could take time it helped us plan for that detail ahead of time and then uh, helped us uh, it made the execution way smooth and then understand the SFTP server, like they use SFT server for file transfers um, for various uh, processes. And when they, when we took this particular uh, PeopleSoft environment and placed it on OCI, how it affected their operational state, operational activity, and how they needed to use this environment going forward and what are the changes that they have to incorporate to work with this migration so these are the uh, things that we identified with this particular customer um, and this particular project um, but the, these could be the outcomes when you review these details and as i said some could be performance oriented but in this particular scenario these were more of uh, executing it and identifying all the customizations that are in place because we had to work with the network team and then vendor network team plan for calls changes and testing and validation so this this is how it helped us in um, interface jobs review the second one being application versions and the certification status so when we looked at when we look at this, first thing we'll start with is obviously is application. Um, because we're taking the application from one platform to other platform, are we still in good standing with the support status? Uh, that is with Oracle, hey, are we on supported versions? Are we, uh, are, are we on a de-supported version? And are we going, to, if we come across any issues while migrating the product, are we going to come across issues? And then let it be application level and DB level. So making sure that as part of this migration, um, we review this information and make sure that either we upgrade first or as part of the migration, we do that, or we migrate first and upgrade. There, there are several ways depending on where you are and what your combination status is. But a review of this, could impact your project line, project timeline and resource activity and what you need to test and how you need to test. So it is very important to review these details upfront, right? And then if we expand that um, application version and availability, how it impacts um, um, at the OS level, right? That is also key. When we go to cloud platforms, and, and OCI, 
there are certain images and then certain security standards that we want to consider and as we are making changes and just by going to a more secure uh, and latest um, operating system can we take ben benefit of it right it's still lift and shift but you're just changing one component or it is mandatory for you to upgrade to the latest um, so reviewing those details helps uh, and avoids any surprises um, later on um, yeah again in this in this scenario you may have a situation where you just need to do you don't have to do anything or you just have to do something at the application level and all other levels you're good or you don't have to do anything at all and you can simply do export lift and shift or you may have to perform certain things um, before you actually can place it on OCI and stay in support mode, right? Um, and then when you come across any change that you need to do, um, whether you do it first or you do it as part of the migration or you do it totally after migrating, if it is possible, right? So those review, those things will help and we'll see how it helped us uh, in this particular scenario what what are the things that we came across uh, first of all we we had to go from ax to rhel because ax is not possible on oci and because we are going from big indian to small indian the database level uh, uh, formatting uh, change we have a limitation on how we can migrate so we were able to identify that okay there is an additional step that we need to do at the database level coming from AX to going to RHEL. And similarly, database was in de-supported, uh, it, de it was in de-supported version. So we had to go to 19C uh, to make sure we are going to the appropriate level. And once we go, go to OCI, you don't have to worry about the support and you can take benefit of two things at once versus migrate and then perform a separate upgrade because um, and and we when we reached that conclusion, we looked at okay, okay, going to 19C is okay, but is application uh, support in supported version or not? If the, in this case application was in supported version, but we needed to do the people tools upgrade to be compatible with the 19C database, so we ended up doing people tools. So as we reviewed these components, we've identified that a change is introduced uh, in all these aspects and we created our project plan and the resource requirement and what to be tested more than anything now that we are touching ax it's not ax to rhel not so much at the application level change 12c to 19c it's only performance we just need to make sure that uh, it, it meets or exceeds uh, current scenario people tools upgrade okay it's it's going to change some visual effects and gui and a few pages familiarity but not functionality as such so once we reviewed these details we were able to again further help the test case scenario and to define what needs to be tested and what are those test cases and who needs to look into it and who needs to approve so this this helped uh, and this helped and changed on overall, as this is all happening at the planning stages, right? So it helped with the overall planning. Now, then the next one is review current uh, storage solution that you have, because when we go to cloud platforms, it is the, there are only few uh, possibilities are there, how you solve a problem. I mean, yes, there are a lot of options, but when it comes to a uh, very per performance centric um, database or an application how we solve the problem the options will become limited uh, we may not have as many options that we have on-prem but again it, it, they can solve the problem but it, everything comes with a cost and, and at times if it is so severe that or if it is very performance centric system um, there are very few options and uh, what can be adopted on cloud 
that needs a cloud thorough review before we can say that, okay, we can place it on OCI. I mean, OCI, yes, Exa data is there and it can solve most of the database problems, um, but it, it is important to review the performance and then associated cost needs as well uh, to meet your storage solution. Uh, currently what you're doing, what is your IOPS throughput requirement? When you go to cloud, what it should be, what, what will be your solution to solve that problem? Does it fit your um, um, cost criteria? Um, and, and all that can be done uh, with the right size exercise. Like again, we have to keep in mind that what, what are the Oracle or CPU licenses that we have? Um, and then choosing the right VM. You may have on-prem system that is scoped to um, uh, allocate like say one year uh, load. And then you, when you purchase the on-prem, you purchased it in that way, but to just to account for future growth. But when you go to cloud, you can do that in less than 30 minutes time, uh, scale up or scale down. Um, so you don't have to do that. So that way you can start off with what you need and then give some room for growth. And then every quarter you keep increasing to the size that you need. Right? So it doesn't have to start with the highest capacity and then go with it. So right sizing is something that contributes to the cost saving. Um, most important thing in the storage solution is that making sure your database throughput needs are reviewed and you have readily available solution to solve the problem on cloud platform is identified. So in this particular, uh, uh, review what we found is this customer um, we've identified required VMs disks on OCI server for database support needs and this was less than one terabyte size so yes it was it, it had few jobs um, as I said like running for 60 minutes and stuff like that but they it wasn't very IOPS centric or uh, very um, high performing database or as such so we were able to just right size, identify the needs and effectively identify associated cost and be confident um, that, okay, even if it grows 10 times or whatever the requirement is, we have a lot of room to grow in each and every aspect uh, to scale up. So, um, so here in this particular project, we didn't, uh, find major challenges that needed solving. We could use out of the box uh, capabilities and uh, objects within OCI and build their environment without any difficulty and challenges. So the next one being data migration strategy. So this strategy becomes crucial depending on whether you have one terabyte to work with or 20 terabytes to work with or 50 terabytes to work with. And then what will be your network bandwidth between your on-prem and OCI to migrate this amount of data. So the bigger the size, the challenge will be big. And then we need to look at Okay, so how many, there are a few aspects to look at, right? How many times do you need to migrate this data as part of your testing strategy? Like, do you, can you take the data once and then just use that for your uh, POC slash UAT, or do you need to take the data three times as before you take production, you have to three times, or do you need to keep um, this data in sync all the time and then just clone within OCI and use it the way you need it. So every aspect, I mean, depending on the need, you need to you need to choose your solution, um, which will again, the, the, we can minimize this downtime to zero with uh, tools and uh, other softwares out there that can be used. Uh, but again, it, everything comes with effort and cost, uh, even if it is free from Oracle for migration needs, then you still need skilled person to do it. And then it adds additional component to take care of it. So all that needs to be reviewed in the data migration strategy. 
and and whatever we are going to use um, it needs to be thoroughly tested along with the cutover activity because most of the time hey well, let's make sure the 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 if it is performance centric usually it starts off with uh, okay, let's put it uh, put one environment there and prove it that it meets or exceeds our prime performance criteria, and then we plan for remaining environments. It's not like we start the project and we start solving the problems. Yeah, if we don't see the problems and it is simple enough, you may not need a POC. But if you have concerns about performance needs or some particular application interface when we move them. To different locations can i still get the same throughput and can i meet my slas so depending on the scenario we have to um, consider how many times we test and how many times we have to uh, my how many times we have to migrate this data over the network to cloud that changes your um, project execution and cut over time needs uh, in this section so when we consider this with uh, this example so given database size uh, less than one terabyte and then cut over being flexible and they were okay with the 24 hours to achieve cross-platform migration that is from big indian to small indian um, we were able to utilize a simple export and import method in which we achieved cross-platform at the same time able to transfer that shut down, perform this, and then migrate it over, uh, import it over to the target system, and then cut over to the production system. So this was, again, in this particular example, it was a simple challenge uh, to execute, um, and we were able to achieve that. So, but we were able to review this upfront, right? And then we were able to put this because uh, we, we needed to do this testing two cycles and we needed to take uh, let's say 29th of one month and 13th of the next month both times we had to take the data from on-prem to cloud and then test it in their uh, testing cycles and then compare with the results of what happened in production and what happened here with respect to data and performance and timing comparisons they were able to perform this so having this discussion up front helped us plan for doing the required backup and then allocating the appropriate time to um, execute these steps as needed and then come up with more accurate uh, project plan otherwise it could change dates for um, admin team infrastructure team and the testing team everyone needs to be available with moving dates uh, and things like that uh, if we didn't plan for this. So the, the next item being uh, storage footprint. So if the the storage footprint reduction uh, on uh, is on cloud with available options. So in this particular example, we did not, because it was less than one terabyte and they had only three uh, total environments, um, there wasn't uh, much to save by reducing the footprint, but if it is like 10 terabyte and they have four environments or five environments, and how to reduce the footprint? Because that on-prem, if you have advanced solution with respect to storage, you may not have that option. You may have an option to solve your performance needs, but you may not have a snap, capab snap capability or, or other sorts of uh, advantages that you may have on-prem so it is it is important to make sure when you go to cloud when you place it place the data on cloud platform is it staying the same is it doubling or increasing and and then if it is changing again like we used to do traditional uh, way where you could put production on advanced storage solution and non production in not so advanced storage solution and then you also have to consider how do you frequently clone? What is your frequent clone methodology? How is, is it going to impact? And then if you have a load and perform environment, are you, do you want to configure that storage equivalent to production or you want to configure it with the 
uh, less capacity or less capable uh, storage because there will be cost implications. So in given ERP uh, systems, when it comes to all other aspects, the storage, if it is performance centric, the big bill is going to come from storage. So it is important to review these aspects and discuss about it and come out with a plan that this is what it will in each environment what storage will be used or if we have to use the advanced um, storage solution um, or if you're going on going to XR data so there, there will be various options that you can choose from right and then accordingly plan for your um, operational state uh, cost with respect to storage fund and again this one as i mentioned it it, it didn't pose a lot of challenge, challenges or at the same time benefits that we could uh, gain from this. So this was a simple solve for us in this case. So the testing uh, strategy, this was key uh, in this, most probably any project this will be key, but um, in, in this particularly for PeopleSoft, how they wanted to execute, uh, how they wanted to compare between the two payroll cycles and making sure that one there is no data mismatch two the performance is there and then they could execute all the interface jobs not all but whatever was possible um, and make sure that there are no surprises um, and we because they were going through first time um, first time exercise of doing this sort of project they had to create the testing strategy and then identify who will be doing it, whether they'll have access, what sort of access is needed. Um, that it helped us um, define that, right? And then KPI strategy in which we were able to say, hey, these are the P1 scenarios. And if this job doesn't complete in this much time, it's a P1 issue for me. So we were able to identify that upfront create that list and then understand those requirements so we could right size the IOPS and, and several ways we will come to that, right? But this, this is one of the component that made us look at, okay, what storage solution we are choosing and what's the CPU count we are choosing um, and is it going to be sufficient or not? So we were able to talk through those and what is the benchmark it's easy to say I, I need this job completed in 60 minutes but then the follow-up question is okay can you regenerate this issue in non-prod and you can confirm that it is going you're going to use the same volume as well not just executed and completed but executed and completed with the like 1 million records something like that and when we conducted this testing strategy we chose the environment where the performance is going to be validated we used actually production servers that we will be used in production and we built the environment and uat was conducted there um, and we were able to come up with a strategy wherein we will repurpose the same servers for production so um, so all these details um, were reviewed um, so in, in doing so, while we reviewed the testing strategy, um, allocated time for creating scripts because they were not uh, present before and then execution uh, plan was allocated and then we were able to plan for resources because they don't have a separate testing team, they had to rely on the business users and we were able to plan for their availability uh, uh, throughout and then execute them when needed and uh, as part of the testing strategy as we talked about a little bit and during the data migration strategy data migration approach it was identified that we will do two testing cycles and the data from production should come from so and so time we were able to plan uh, whatever is needed like taking backup and migrating it to cloud and importing it that exercise to happen when we release the respective environments at the same time taking the backup on the specific date at a specific time. So that helped uh, plan for that uh, versus just working with uh, um, 
one stale data in two different times. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, it's like we chose production servers um, to be the UA to be conducted on production servers. Now we, by doing so, we identified that all the interface connectivities, any firewall issues, we got a we got a chance to validate them and make sure they work and there are no surprises. Um, and by doing this, uh, we got enough confidence that, okay, we've executed the same process twice. And when it comes to production, it's going to be the third process. At least business was able to, it's not first time they're doing it. They kind of looked at the all things that could change as part of the PeopleSoft moving to OCI. And they were they were confident in what they needed to do and there was no resistance or uh, additional stress um, associated with it. So the last part here is the future state backup monitoring solutions. So it is often we, we talk to, okay, can we solve the problem by placing it there and then we can solve these issues later, but it is important to make sure um, we review what will be the backup solution, how we are going to do, because there will be cost impact and how it will be uh, addressed. And uh, when we adopt these solutions, is it me meeting RTO, RPO or not? Uh, and then what kind of monitoring tools will be used? And if, is it, do we need to, do we need to establish that if you have an ITSM tool and there is integration in place, how, how is that gonna change? What, what are all the initiatives that we need to take to reintegrate with the existing system that so support teams can still work the way they are working, right? So with these tasks will take time and they, they need other team members. More often uh, we see that we have to work with other teams to make these changes and plan and schedule. So it is important to make sure that these activities are done as part of your non-prod or at least uh, schedule something to address these things uh, as part of uh, <clears throat> the POC or non-prod environment setup or UAT criteria. This should be one of the criteria to validate. It may not be part of the approval criteria, but validation criteria. So you kind of know everything that is there um, to um, understand which could impact your timeline, any tools change, uh, any cost uh, change, right? Uh, so it, it just takes you to that final state and keeps you gives you that confidence that, okay, this is how I'm going to operate and this is how all the teams involved with my PeopleSoft environment uh, is covered as well. And then last but, last but not least, is there a possibility to hibernate certain number of environments, um, keeping them up only 12 hours, keeping them down by 12 hours, or keeping them during the down during the weekends, depending on number of servers and what your usage criteria, whether you have a global 24 by seven model or you have just a US only eight hours model or a 12 hours model where team members will be accessing the non-prod environments and you can bring them down. Or you can even take advantages of like, okay, the environments, they need to be busy in certain weeks for each environment. They don't need to be busy or at a full capacity throughout the month because there is certain automation possible for hibernation and scale up, scale down. Some strategies can be uh, applied to keep that operational cost um, at minimum. Uh, but yes, it, it takes some time and effort to come up with that strategy and then um, uh, make it automatic or make it operational, um, wh whatever time and effort that needs to be spent. If you do it, then you'll have a much greater uh, control uh, <clears throat> on the operational span. And then, so uh, how did how did it help for the current scenario? Yes, we implemented backup, uh, looking at their RPO and RTO and RPO scenarios. We reiterated how their RTO RPO scenario is going to be, uh, how it can be done, and we were able to show them 
while performing uh, a refresh uh, of database, hey, this is how we will do it, and this is how long it's going to take um, for your backup, using backup and restoring it uh, to another environment or uh, recovering. In this particular scenario, they didn't go for DR, um, but we were able to exercise and show how, if there is a DR situation, how this can be executed. And for database monitoring, OEM, VM monitoring, we didn't uh, put any tools specifically for them. And then established process process for them because when they go onto OCI, the cloning needs to, data refresh needs to happen. How to refresh the data, what is the process? We were able to uh, create a document and establish, right? And then um, reviewed hibernation possibilities to utilize capabilities. Again, less number of environments and there wasn't much written on investment if we spent time and energy in reducing this and their model included onshore, offshore. So it it it, it wasn't uh, of much benefit for them. All right, with that said, we reached the conclusion. The conclusion is by what we've, time and again, what we've seen is by reviewing unknown concerns, reviewing all these areas, we will we will turn unknown concerns into known concerns and possible action plan to address them as part of planning. And in doing so, every team involved um, in this change were very collaborative and because they were notified up front, um, they are aware of what change is coming, what should be changed, and the, what, how that change impacts the application and the criticality of it. They're not jumping on a P1 call and forced to solve something on a time limit. Um, but and, and as we go through this more and more, we've seen uh, more benefits uh, with the overall smooth execution of plan, timely execution of plan, um, efficient uses of resources, and more importantly, the confidence that they will build having zero to no incidents on OCI platform or um, any platform on a totally new platform, uh, it just makes huge difference. And people who are concerned at the beginning, but as we take them through this journey, this is how I'm going to ensure that this is, these are all the aspects that I looked at, and still, if you have anything that I didn't address, that's how we were able to uh, give them confidence in what we are doing and how we are doing. Um, this is our experience with uh, this particular uh, section. Um, all right, we reached a question and answer session. Um, Matt, do you have any questions? Hi, yes, we do. So the first question here is, what challenges might there be going from going uh, from an on-prem PeopleSoft MS SQL server database to an Oracle database on OCI? So the, the challenge so it depends on how big the database is and uh, what is the downtime availability. But if it is just the the challenge is going to, you can do it in several ways. You can transform the data from SQL to Oracle on-prem and then just ship Oracle to Oracle, right? So the challenge here is getting your data to RDBMS and making your application connect to RDBMS database, that is Oracle database. So it's it's figuring out uh, depending on the size and uh, any additional complexities that are that are applicable to underneath tools that are available to migrate from SQL Server to Oracle, but these are most popular databases, right? So you, it's it's not a great challenge, but it just needs a little bit of review and then planning, like how much downtime you need, um, but not something. Um, that needs to be considered as a huge challenge. Okay, next question. Uh, when the leadership saw the 40% cost savings and other improvement, 
Did mm -hmm. they consider not going SaaS and staying on OCI? No. So because it the that is why you wanted to make sure that the the overall objective of the leadership is to transform not just get benefited from 40 percent 40 percent is is a benefit um, from current spend but when it comes to the more additional capabilities and functionality that they need to introduce and be able to introduce as business changes and needs change right now they're stuck they're limited but they want to grow and they want to get to a better state so the current state did not give them their end goal so yeah it's just a out of 24 months projects this is the first phase of the project and uh, which was a great success and it just built a lot of confidence and and they actually started that journey as of now okay and you mentioned a people soft or uh, you mentioned a people tools upgrade what mm -hmm. people tools release was used in their on-prem environment and which did they upgrade to um i if i'm not wrong it was 8.57 to uh 9.2 um and what um they didn't they didn't come across uh, other than some login pages and stuff they didn't come across any functionality difference or any, anything like that there are a few pages uh, modifications that was uh, raised as a concern in the beginning um but it, it, nothing with respect to functionality okay and this question, uh, we use SMB2 shares to allow the business users to place a file on Linux application server via, micro, via Microsoft Windows share, i.e. Mm -hmm. both mapped to the same place. Example, the business has an input file. They put the Windows share, that Windows share is mounted on the Linux box. Therefore, the application server can then use the file. Is this possible in the OCI environment? Yes, this is actually one of the um, scenario that they needed to in a different form. So basically you are giving customers to place the file, right? Now they're co-located and now your end server is moving. So you can still place an automation uh, if you have automation tools in place or you can still place scripts to transfer the file on an event-based uh, scenario, or you just need to make sure that the, the domain, that is the network account ID that was given to them um, is recognizable. So you have to establish hybrid domain between on-prem Active Directory and OCI and make sure the privileges still work. Okay, does OCI work with a non-Unicode database? Non-Unicode database. Um, I may need more details to answer that better. Um, I mean, but does PeopleSoft, I mean, we, we have to go with what PeopleSoft supports, right? So PeopleSoft supports only um, four to five SQL Server, Oracle, DB2, uh, these versions. So I, if this is just any database, then I, I'm afraid I'm not qualified to make that statement uh, across any database platform. Um, but if, if it is within PeopleSoft, we have to go with what PeopleSoft supports. Uh, the follow-up to that is Oracle non-Unicode. And what version is it? Nineteen C. Uh, I will have to verify and confirm, but I, I think so. I mean, based on what I can think of now, if nineteen C is nineteen C is supported with the PeopleSoft, and as long as your application people taught people tools is supported then 
there is no reason to believe it cannot be uh, supported. Okay, and have you looked at using Cloud Manager? We've looked at it, but we had very tight timeline and with any tool, there will be limitations and familiarity and it just, the, the, these cloud managers work great if your requirement fits the design of the cloud manager versus if you have one small deviation then you're stuck with working with a support engineer to solve your problem or whatever issue you come across now you can't start from scratch so when we quickly reviewed for this project need um we didn't find them like particularly coming from AX to RHEL cross-platform migration and additional components that we need to bring in to make it smooth. Uh, we didn't, and again, number of environments that they had and the way they needed the fresh data, we, we didn't find cloud manager to be useful in our scenario. Okay, we'd have a couple minutes left. Last question, how does a, a highly customized and development heavy environment work on OCI? What challenges or additional complexities would you anticipate? So highly customizable technical aspect, um, it doesn't make a difference because it is, an, again, I'm talking about infrastructure as a code, not SaaS or PaaS solutions. If you bring those components, yes, your highly customized uh, environment and there will be limitations and for every customizations, you have to do fit gap analysis and understand one, is there a solution that is readily available? Two, if it is not available, what is that new customization is going to look like? Okay, 90% of customizations are satisfied, 10% not, then how do you solve that and look for that solution? um that that's how we have to look at but if it is purely infrastructure as a service you have to look at the interface jobs and the, technically if you can place you're just moving your people soft servers from one location to the other location now if you have 100 interfaces versus 10 interfaces and out of 100 interfaces 90 of them still stay on uh, on prem yeah they may come to oci over the time but that is a situation where you're moving one component and rest stays there and again based on the volume and what kind of transactions you do have what is the frequency um it needs a thorough review to say whether it is possible or is there a risk or not so the first component interface jobs and review helps you with that question okay that wraps up our questions mahesh do you have any closing thoughts um yep I, I just wanted to thanks thank you everyone for joining and listening to our experience and if you have further um questions or uh, clarifications that uh, i can help with um, um I, I i'll be leaving or i can put my mail id in uh, the chat um, please reach out we can help uh, whatever is needed Okay, thank you very much. And thanks again for joining us. A quick reminder that all recordings will be on the Quest website and available to Quest members. So for more content like today's, I hope you will join us at the Blueprint 4D conference in Dallas, Texas, May 8th through the 11th. There will be more great content like you heard today. Registration is open right now on our website, questoraclecommunity.org. Uh, to lock in the early bird rate discount, please register before March 20th. So we have a couple of weeks left prior to the early bird registration rate going up. Uh, we hope to see you in Dallas at the Blueprint Conference. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, Mahesh. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone.